do it. Okay, you're live. Well, welcome. Welcome, everyone. It's wonderful to be here with you uh, in the beloved community convergence. What an honor to be here on Martin Luther King Day. Uh, what a tremendous privilege it is uh, for us to be gathering as a beloved community. My name is Ben Bowler from Unity Earth, uh, and I'm pleased to be here with you with a stellar panel to really lift up the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King in the context of his contribution to interfaith harmony and understanding and global brotherhood and sisterhood uh, from an interfaith or even interspiritual context. And what's extraordinary about the panel that's come together, we have Dr. Kurt Johnson, who really wrote the book on the interspiritual age, uh, and we'll be hearing from Kurt about his insights into Martin Luther King and the broader civil uh, rights um, movement and its roots in interfaith sensibilities. Very important as we look forward to uh, the, the direction of the future the world is going. We also have Dr. Marty K. Casey from the Ungarn Institute, uh, you know, one of the many heirs of the legacy of uh, Dr. King, who's going to be sharing about her perspective on, uh, on his life and work and legacy and how it's touched her, and also how uh, Martin Luther King is a beacon for world unity looking forward. And we have uh, the wonderful Jonathan Granoff, uh, who really is also an expert on Martin Luther King and his legacy in many spaces, uh, including in the spiritual and interspiritual uh, meaning and uh, the profound prophetic vision that Martin Luther King had for a united uh, human family, which in this context we are referring to as the beloved community. So we, we meet today, uh, one, we can't be um, in any way, uh, you couldn't not be aware of the context in which we are meeting. Uh, a world divided, uh, the country of America, uh, you know, teetering on the brink. Um, and of course, this context of this beloved community coming together through John and Becky and everyone who many hands have pulled this together uh, is incredibly poignant moment. We in 2020 really launched uh, together with many organizations, the first World Unity Week around the mid-year solstice. Uh, and we're really looking at 2020 as a year zero they kind of reset the whole, you know, everything on the planet. And, uh, and we're entering in, in, in through the fringe of chaos, we're entering into year one and looking ahead to June and World Unity Week in June with all of the hundreds of global partnerships uh, that are coming together for that. So we wanted to come together today on, on Martin Luther King Day and really uh, hold up Martin Luther King as an icon for world unity, as a beacon for uh, all of the work of all of these many groups around the world as we look ahead to June and uh, World Unity Week uh, one coming up in uh, five months time. So the real expertise is, uh, is, is Dr. Johnson, Dr. Marty and, and Jonathan Granoff. So let's dive into it. Uh, this is the Martin Luther King as a icon for world unity. And to take us into it, uh, my great honor to introduce a friend and mentor, Dr. Kurt Johnson. Okay, great, Ben. Thank you so much. Now, I said that I would do this in 10 minutes or less. So what I'm going to do is pretend that I'm on Voice America and I'll stick very close to the script. So what I want to do is share some facts and timelines and historical personages that can further inform and greatly enhance this discussion that we're going to have. Because often when we're thinking of the civil rights movement, we only think of the organizations and activities in the South. But there were at least three major historical and worldwide contexts that were going on simultaneously at this same time. So the first, of course, is the organizations and activities in the South. The second is the national and international ecumenical organizations that were organized in support and the third is the role of university campuses and university chapels and chaplains. So first of all, the organizations and activities in the South, the diverse civil rights initiatives and their leaders. So here, if we were gonna create a very general informative timeline for ourselves, it looks something like this. 1955 to 1960 were the bus boy boycotts. 1959 to 1961, the sit-in movements. 1961 to 1962, the freedom rides. 1962 to 1963, the celebrated marches, including Birmingham 
and then Washington, D.C. in 1963. And these were all on the background of the numerous major organizations like CORE, C-O-R-E, the Congress of Racial Equality, NSM, the National and Other Student Movements, the SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and of course, Dr. King's organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, or SCLC, and many more. Now, second were the national and international ecumenical organizations that were organized in support. Now, the chief of these was the, was the Fellowship of Reconciliation, which at the time was in 70 nations, and even at the time of the Civil Rights Movement, had four Nobel Peace Prize winners, and King became their sixth Nobel Peace Prize winner in 1964. And the Fellowship of Reconciliation gave major international support to the civil rights movement throughout the 1960s. And then there was the Gandhi Society that was formed worldwide in 1961 and 1962 for both high level intellectual and financial support of the larger movement. Now the background here was also Vatican II, if you don't remember, the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council, which ran from 1959 to 1965, happening at the same time and stressing first, the unity of all religious experience and second, the unity of all religions regarding the issues of social and economic justice. So third then was the role of university campuses and university chapels and chaplains. And this included, of course, some of the most famous people in the movement, like William Sloan Coffin at Yale University, but particularly who we want to remember here, who was such a close friend of Dr. King, is Howard Thurman. So Howard Thurman first at the chapel of Howard University and then at Boston University. And Thurman was a close personal friend of Martin Luther King's father and he became a mentor to Martin Luther King when King was doing his PhD in theology at Boston University, 1951 to 1955. Now Thurman knew Gandhi personally and had visited him many times. And Thurman had written the book, Jesus and the Disinherited, 1949, which King said was the most influential book in his life. And Thurman altogether wrote 20 books and he worked with the fellowship of reconciliation in establishing the education and training programs on Gandhi's nonviolent methodologies. And Thurman also organized the first multiracial ecumenical church in the United States, the Church for the Fellowship of All Peoples. So similarly and lastly, then the Freedom Riders were inspired by another famous book, 1947, which was published by the Fellowship of Reconciliation and entitled The Journey of Reconciliation by the famous Afro-American author Bayard Rustan. And that was the basis of emphasizing for the whole civil rights movement, the solidarity of clergy across all the traditions and traveling to and participating in the civil rights activities multiracially and side by side. So these are a lot of the elements that made up that time. If we take the time to go back and just look at it, it in the context of the time. And that's the realm of detail that I wanted to kind of background the discussion in. So thanks for listening. Thank you, Kurt. Beautiful uh, for that synopsis and historical background. And just, just beginning to really look at some of the threads there of, uh, of the life of Martin Luther King, which of course didn't just happen in a vacuum, but was happening in the context. And what an incredible period of time with everything that was fermenting at that time, including Vatican II. Also, you know, worth noting throughout his life, uh, Martin Luther King had very significant uh, friendships with uh, other interfaith leaders and spiritual leaders from um, uh, very different traditions to, to his own as a Southern Baptist. Of course, he never met Mahatma Gandhi, but as you started to lay out there, Kurt, he was very influenced by the work. His trip to India, I think in 1967 uh, was, was incredibly important. Uh, work for him. Oh, uh, sorry, his first trip in 1959 to India. Um, the other one that struck me just as, a, as, a, as an observer was when he wrote the letter um, 
for Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, uh, supporting him to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. His, his deep appreciation for the Vietnamese Buddhist leader um, was quite extraordinary. Um, and they really shared those common values of peace building and community making, as well as religious devotion, even though there were different religions. In 1967, Martin Luther King nominated uh, Thich Nhat Hanh for the Nobel Peace Prize. And let, let's just read what he wrote about, um, about the Vietnamese Buddhist leader. I do, not, I do not personally know of anyone more worthy of this prize than this gentle monk from Vietnam. He is an apostle of peace and nonviolence. His ideas for peace, if applied, would build a monument to ecumenism, to world brotherhood, and to humanity. Now, this is a powerful testimony uh, of an interspiritual sensibility beyond just interfaith tolerance and harmony and even um, uh, discourse. This is, this is a deep love across traditions. And what I think makes it even more remarkable is that in the interfaith movement, um, you have leading lights from the Catholic world or from the various Hindu world, but coming from the Southern Baptist, I think this is really an extraordinary aspect of a multifaceted um, uh, prophetic le legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King is just how much he saw uh, God in traditions other than his own and saw the divine in devoted uh, uh, religious practitioners of, of, of religious viewpoints uh, and uh, traditions other than his own. Really a tremendous, um, uh, something to, to really uh, dwell on and, uh, and, to, and to unpack and, and can guide us forward. And I think there's more work to be done in really uh, unpacking all that this can hold for us in our day and time um, as we are here in 2021. So, with that, and that's why we're here today, is really to look at Martin Luther King in this light as an interspiritual leader and a guiding light for humanity as we enter into uh, the next phase of our evolutionary journey uh, into a more united world. And someone who has been tireless uh, in this work of uh, justice and healing and unity and transformation is uh, the amazing Dr. Marty K. K. I mentioned before, Marty, you are one of the heirs uh, of the of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, we're so delighted to have you here with us today uh, in this beloved community convergence. Welcome, Dr. Marty. You're on mute. There you go. There you are. Okay. Thank you, Ben. It's so good to see you and all of the other faces here today, um, as we have been gathering uh, around the beloved community all weekend. The spirit of Dr. King lives. It lives in each of us. Every moment, every word spoken, every song sung, everything is the spirit of Dr. King and how we are able to keep his dream alive. I wanna thank uh, Mr. Kurt Johnson uh, for his remarkable research of Dr. King. And I wish that I could come to you in that same format, but I can't. I am not a big history buff, I'm not. Hopefully I'm making history somewhere along the way, but I truly can't necessarily say I can speak to it in that manner. So through this conversation today, I would like to just share a few stories with you of how I have been a direct beneficiary of the work of Dr. Martin Luther King. See, Dr. King, his life was taken from all of us so unexpectedly. And when I tell you we lost a legend, a king, an extraordinary leader in 1968. And I was not born until 1971. So by the time I came along and was moving about, if you will, um, in the world, all I could see was green lights. I saw that the possibilities of whatever it is I thought I wanted to do, wherever I wanted to go, whoever I wanted to talk to, the green light was on for me to do that. And I really didn't know that at one time that there was a red light. And because of the the red light is why Dr. King began the, the work as a civil rights leader. And I just saw something today that he, he graduated from high school, 
by the time he was 15. And I think they said he had his first degree by the time he was 19, his master's by the time he was 22, and maybe his doctorate, I could be wrong on that, Kurt, you can help later. Maybe I think that's maybe 24, 26. He was born in purpose to move a nation. If you look at his track record and how God was using him, he was born to move a nation. When he delivered the I Have a Dream speech from the Lincoln Memorial in 1963, he stood in front of 200,000 men and women from all over the world. In 1963, this is before the green light came on. His words empowered, inspired, encouraged, and they gave us hope. And by his words and his suggestions of being nonviolent, the world was listening. He did not do this alone. He had so many people by his side that believed in him. But what they understood is that getting in good trouble, as Congressman John Lewis would put it, we could restore hope in a very hopeless time of our history. And so we understand today, if we look at the difference sometimes between leadership, what you say matters, but what are you speaking? Dr. King gave us the example of what we should say, how we should say it, and the intent behind it. And I believe if we took a page or two from Dr. King, we can move our nation forward. We can restore hope. We can gain the faith that so many individuals have lost from their own personal experiences. And that I am so grateful. I have coined a word, I call myself an activist. It's because I'm a professional actress and an activist. And I love that because I think of other, maybe what I would call them would be artivists. Who would be an artivist? Stevie Wonder was an artivist. Because Stevie Wonder used his art of music and he had written and performed happy birthday song to Dr. King that we hear every year around this time. That song was so powerful that in the celebration for Dr. King in 1981, that song was performed in front of 25,000 people. Where? Where you think? In Washington, DC. So who you think was hearing that song? Who you think was activated by that song? Even the president of the United States, Ronald Reagan, was moved to be empowered and inspired by Stevie Wonder writing a song saying that it would, for it not to be a holiday, right? Because of all of what he did, it would be a shame. King Holiday and President Ronald Reagan, he signed the bill to make what we are now today celebrating together. That's how it became a holiday because of the keen leadership again of a president that used his words to do good. I tell you someone else, who's close to us that you know, what I would call an artifice. Pato and Antoinette, when I experience their videos, it's a history lesson for anyone from children to adults using their artistry to move and empower people. I also wanna share just a couple of things as I close. I had the great fortune because I am a beneficiary of Dr. King and that green light being on. That when 
unrest took place in my backyard, as I'd like to describe it, in Ferguson, Missouri. As an artist, I said, I need to show up. I need to do something. I need to use my voice, my stage, my, my, my uh, connections, my ability to show up, to be used to, for good. And I hit the streets. And that's when I became an activist. Now, I, I have to I can step back just a little bit. I have to tell you this real quick. When I was in college in 1990, they were not observing Dr. King's holiday. I shut the whole campus down. I told everybody in my, my school, we're not going to class. No, we should be observing this holiday. It was signed in 1983. Here it is, 1990. Why are we having class? I shut it down and I taught blacks and whites how to sing songs, happy birthday, we shall overcome, kumbaya, you name it, we sang. And we did not go to class. If you call my university today, uh, Missouri Baptist University, a state college here, it was a state college here, now a university. They're closed. They're closed today. They're closed because that's what activism can do. It can activate and it can, it can make things change for the good. So I want to fast forward back to Ferguson. So here I am knowing what I did back in college. Oh, I can do it again. I feel like I can do it again. And I hit the streets and I joined so many others to be a beacon of light in such a dark moment. The following year in October, 2015, I received a phone call because I was in a, a movie that was coming out with the International Film Festival and someone else had a movie coming out, a documentary. It was Congressman John Lewis. They called me, they said, Marty, because of your work in Ferguson and you, you're in a movie, he's in a movie, we want you to pick him up and take him, and take him around the whole time he's here in St. Louis. When I picked him up from the airport, I asked him if he wanted to go to Ferguson. He and his assistant was like, oh, absolutely. I had the honor and the privilege to escort Congressman John Lewis, the very man who stood side by side with Dr. King during the movement, the civil rights movement. He stood in the very spot where Michael Brown was shot and killed in 2014. But this was a year later and he wept. I mean, he cried like a baby in the streets. And when he got back in the car, he looked at me and he said, I'm sorry. What do you, I, I, I was, I didn't understand. He says, I'm sorry because I thought when we marched across that bridge in Selma that we ended this. And I can see that we did not. He says, young lady, I'm handing you this baton. And I want you to carry it across the finish line. Writing's not that easy, but I Grammarly can help. Would. This sentence is grammatically correct, but it's wordy, hard to read. It undermines the writer's message. Who's, uh, thank you, sorry, somebody had themselves off mute. Sorry, Marty, you there, Marty? Back to you. Let's see, okay. Look like everybody's videos have come off. Yeah, uh, Becky did that as a protection measure. Oh, so when some, but we're all fine and okay, you can continue. So you know, one thing about when you're telling the truth, it doesn't need any, <laughs> right back up where you left off. <laughs> That's right. So <clears throat> in that moment, I knew I had been given an extraordinary charge on my life. And I really, when I think back, I believe that was truly the moment as to how you all have become to know the person that I am today. Because Congressman John Lewis said some words that empowered me in a way that in that moment, I, I didn't even understand the power of those words. But I'm carrying that baton. But I've been telling people all weekend, I can't move it one inch. But together, I believe we can all carry it across. 
It takes all of us. And when I think about all of the things that we have been experiencing around the world, but specifically in our nation, the United States of America, I have to say to you, the one thing we must do is collectively move together. We have to come together to do anything that will be impactful, that will, will make a difference, that will protect the youth and honor our elders and activate those in between. I had an opportunity on August 28, 2020, the middle of a pandemic, go back to that very same spot where Dr. King delivered his speech. And when we were there for the march honoring Dr. King, I was surrounded by all the family that have been affected by gun violence around this nation. George Floyd's family was there, Michael Brown's, Oscar Grant's, Breonna Taylor, so many, Jacob's family, you, Jacob Blake's, you name it. Even if you can't remember the name, Trayvon Martin's family, every every last one of those family, families that have been affected by gun violence and their children have been taken from them in the streets, they were there. They showed up, I believe, because they believe in the words that Dr. King spoke in us so many years before. It's so easy to get your hands on a gun, but what good would it do if they picked up a gun and began to shoot back the people that shot their family? It would do no good. So they have been empowered by the words of Dr. King. Nonviolence is what we must practice. No hate, more love. I'm proud to be a beneficiary of Dr. King. And there's so much more that I can share with you, but I, don't, I wanna respect the time. So I just say to you, I pray that we all remember that Dr. King's most powerful to me, most powerful essence of who he was. He made the choice to love. Mm, beautiful, Dr. Marty K. Casey. Beautiful. Thank you for bringing your extraordinary spirit uh, into this circle and, and space and sharing with all of us your incredible, you know, blessing of the legacy that you're carrying forward and the torch that you're carrying forward marty supported by uh, so many uh so many and all of us and it's a privilege to walk with you uh on this journey it's um it's a great blessing and you have such an incredible conviction and uh devotion uh to the ideals and the principles uh, of dr martin luther king i want to i want to make comment that when the history books are written about this current time uh, in the United States, uh, one thing that can't be avoided is the role of religion uh, in what's taking place. And when you look at the state of American Christianity today, uh, and I know it's a very broad tapestry, but I'm talking about the, the American Christianity that has supported uh, the Trump presidency passionately and uh, with, with, without uh, qualification. And you compare it, the, the, that kind of insular cut off from the outside, listening to their own voices, um, distrustful of anything that isn't part of their own tribe, um, and, and the role that that has played in supporting and empowering the Trump-Pence years, um, even, even to the point of what's taken place here in January 2021. And you compare that to the kind of generosity that this Baptist leader, Dr. Martin Luther King had 50, 60 years ago, um, 60 years ago plus. It's, it's, it really is an incredibly stark difference. I mentioned before about what he said about Thich Nhat Hanh being an apostle, an apostle of peace and nonviolence. 
Can you imagine evangelical Christian leaders, uh, the traditional ones now saying that about someone of a different religion today? Uh, where is that generosity of spirit? Now, it does still exist through the writings of people like Brian McLaren and others, but where is that, where is that generosity of spirit? I want to read one more thing that King said about Gandhi, and just, just, just hear this. King called Gandhi the first person in history to lift the love ethic of Jesus above mere interaction between individuals to a powerful and effective social force. This is a Baptist Christian leader saying this about uh, a Hindu philosopher and practitioner. It really is extraordinary. Let that not be lost on us today. The importance of the interspiritual ethic, uh, as Marty said, that King chose love above theological differences and philosophical differentiations. It is a very significant uh, uh, um, aspect of, of Dr. King's legacy. So as we move forward into the next section, I couldn't think of a better person to navigate us through these, uh, these, these waters. As we've gone from Dr. Kurt Johnson and looking at the historical uh, co coordination and convergence of uh, uh, these different movements and into Ma Dr. Marty K. Casey's passionate personal testimonial and the torch that she is carrying in a spiritual uh, sense to, to carry on the tradition and the work of Martin Luther King. And as we now look at a broad geopolitical context of how do we move through from where we are to where we need to be, uh, Jonathan Granoff is a leading intellectual on the planet, a spiritual leader, a thought leader, an activist in his own right uh, in so many different ways. Jonathan, it's a delight to have you with us. And I know that this is a subject about which you are very passionate. Thank you, Ben. And uh, thank you, Dr. Marty and Kurt. Um, and thank everybody for joining. My dad produced one of the early uh, civil rights protest songs with Lena Horne. It was the tune of Havana Gila, Havana Gila, Havana Gila, with Lena Horne singing, we want our freedom, we want our freedom, we want it now, now, now. So I, that was, my dad produced that because Martin Luther King was a leader of principle, not identity. So he could go from sit-ins at a counter to public transportation to wages for workers, to poverty, to war, to militarism, to justice, to everyone of goodwill is welcome to work together. And our adversaries, who in the late 1960s had a series of assassinations, Fred Hampton in Chicago, Bobby Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and many others, promoted identity politics to divide us. And one of the things we've seen this past year is although the term was Black Lives Matter, people knew who joined in that it was All Lives Matter. Because this, and why this, why this movement is so powerful is that white people were welcome. You didn't have to have a black identity or a gay identity or a woman identity or, a, or any identity, you could join on principle. So I wanna let Martin Luther King's words themselves set forth the principle that brings us together. The only way we can honor him, the only way is by living those principles. So listen to his words. We, you know, we, know, we know the I have a dream speech, we hear that all the time. But here, which is amazing, and thank God for Clarence Jones, who helped as a speech writer and a lawyer, not as well known. Martin Luther King was not alone when he did this. I mean, he, he lived a living community. We see him as the figurehead but he lived a community. There were a lot of strong men and women with him, putting themselves on the line. I know my cousin, I had a cousin was in the, uh, was in the uh, Freedom Rides, a very close cousin, Sharon. Martin Luther King said in his Nobel lecture when he received the Nobel Prize, 
Recent events have vividly reminded us that nations are not reducing, but rather increasing their arsenals of weapons of mass destruction. The best brains in the highly developed nations of the world are devoted to military technology. The proliferation of nuclear weapons has not been halted in spite of the limited test ban treaty. The fact that most of the time, human beings put the truth about the nature and risks of nuclear war out of their minds because it is too painful and therefore not acceptable, does not alter the nature and risks of such a war. The device of rejection may temporarily cover up anxiety, but it does not bestow peace of mind and emotional security. There may have been a time when war served as a negative good by preventing the spread and growth of an evil force, but the destructive power of modern weapons eliminated even the possibility that war may serve as a negative good. If we assume that life is worth living and that man has a right to survive, then we must find an alternative to war. In a day when vehicles hurtled through outer space and guided ballistic missiles carve highways of death through the stratosphere, no nation can claim victory in war. A so-called limited war will have little, leave little room more than a calamitous legacy of human suffering, political turmoil, and spiritual disillusionment. A world war, God forbid, will leave only smoldering ashes as a mute testimony of a human race whose folly led inexorably to ultimate death. So if modern man continues to flirt unhesitatingly with war, he will transform his earthly habitat into an inferno such that even the mind of Dante could not imagine. I do not wish to minimize the complexity of the problems that need to be faced in achieving disarmament and peace. But I think it is a fact that we shall not have the will, the courage, and the insight to deal with such matters unless in this field we are prepared to undergo a mental and spiritual re-evaluation. A change of focus which will enable us to see that the things which seem most real and powerful are indeed now unreal and have come under the sentence of death. We need to make a supreme effort to generate the readiness, indeed the eagerness to enter the new world, which is now possible. The city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is God. It is not enough to say we must not wage war. It is necessary to love peace and sacrifice for it. We have inherited a big house, a great world house, in which we have to live together, black and white, Easterner, Westerner, Gentiles and Jews, Catholics and Protestants, Muslims and Hindu, a family unduly separated in ideas, culture and interests who, because we can never again live without each other, this means that we must learn somehow in this one big world to live with each other. This means that more and more our loyalties must become ecumenical rather than sectional. We must now give an overriding loyalty to mankind, humankind, as a whole in order to preserve the best in our individual societies. This call for a worldwide fellowship that lifts neighborly concern beyond one's tribe, race, class, and nation is in reality a call for an all-embracing, and unconditional love for all men. I apologize for the gender. He, he, we know he meant everyone. Let me continue. When I speak of love, I am not speaking of some sentimental and weak response, which is little more than emotional bosh. I am speaking of that force which all the great religions have seen as the supreme unifying principle of life. Love is somehow the key that unlock, unlocks the door that leads to ultimate reality. Wait a minute, let me read that again. Love is somehow the door that unlocks, it, it is somehow the key that unlocks the door which leads to ultimate reality. And this is me speaking. I believe that the mystery that placed the power of destruction in the binding forces of the atom has placed the healing power of love in our hearts and further gifted all of us with the courage 
and wisdom to use that power effectively. Thus, I agree with Dr. King as he continues. I refuse to accept the cynical notion that nation after nation must spiral down a militaristic stairway into the hell of nuclear annihilation. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. I believe that, that even amidst Today's mortar bursts and whining bullets, there is still hope for a brighter tomorrow. I believe that wounded justice lying prostrate on the blood flowing streets of our nations can be lifted from this dust of shame to reign supreme among the children of men. I have the audacity to believe that people everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture for their minds and dignity, equality and freedom for their spirits. I believe what self-centered men have torn down, men other-centered can build up. Now, end of his speech. And I think we have the choice to respond to this call from a conscience awakened by the source of nonviolent redemptive goodwill, which is the great mystery that put us here to discover that great mystery. And with the help of each, which is a gift in our hands to choose, and the help of God, which is a gift surely granted. We can and will become the change we want to see. We can and will realize ourselves as the children and thus rightful heirs of the power which brought us into this world, the rightful heirs of this power, which is the power of love. We can and should be grateful for the wisdom of those who served as courageous examples. The wind is always blowing on the ocean, and even when it's against you, you can tack and sail through it. But you can't go anywhere until the sail is unfurled. So our job is not to create the wind of wisdom, the wind of grace, the wind of love. Our job is to unfurl the sails of our hearts. May this unfurling and this opening be our commitment in our work and allow the wind of wisdom and God's grace and blessing guide us. It will be the wind behind us. That wind will not be in front of us. Amen. 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 Jonathan Granoff, it is uh, it's just such a beautiful thing. I feel like we've been at church and, uh, you know, the Reverend Martin Luther King and, and the spirit that you just brought uh feels like the wind you have brought you have brought uh the wind in your words and your spirit with us today so i, I want to thank you we do have a few minutes for reflection um but i just want to thank you jonathan and marty and kurt uh this has been a beautiful tapestry coming together uh and we have about you know eight minutes left for us to to discuss marty i want to ask you what what is your <laughs> i can see the joy in your in your being there with uh, what's your reflection on jonathan's uh on jonathan's presentation there oh, oh my good jonathan you and i need to be friends we need we need, i can talk to you all day every day i felt everything from the moment that you mentioned lena horn again another great artivist if you will uh, I, I love the fact that in that piece, you, you mentioned uh, the mental and the spiritual transformation that Dr. King spoke about. The, if we, I, I have to highlight that mental and spiritual transformation. I, I have written, ungun our hearts so we can heal our minds. Ungun our hearts so we can heal our minds. And that came to me by just listening to you speak, Jonathan. Oh my goodness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I actually wanted to just give a short reflection on what Marty said, because when you said you were born in, I think, 71, and then I was thinking of when I had delivered that timeline. So 1969, I became a Holy Cross father in the Anglican communion. And the first thing we were asked to do and all of us did was join the Fellowship of Reconciliation. And this was within a couple of years after Martin Luther King's assassination and the, the work was still going on. And in the seventies then we actually worked with C.T. Vivian and uh, J.D. Otis Roberts who was at the Atlanta Theological Union. 
to create what was called the National Conference on Church Social Action at Lincoln Center in 1978, trying to reignite that energy and that passion because your comment and then Ben's comment, we would not recognize the church today. Back then it was a requisite to even have a clerical caller that you were a social activist for all of these causes. And how were we able to do that at Lincoln Center? Well, it was Leonard Bernstein. We had done a program with his daughter, Jamie, and we said to Jamie, go ask your dad whether he would you know, arrange for Lincoln Center for this conference to see what can be reignited and re-energized in, in the work. And, and he did that, but it's so different today. And, that, and that's tragic. And I think all of us are kind of waiting to see when that could reignite. Last thing I'll say, Baird Rustin, same thing. What a great man and a great book. And yet he could not be out front because he was gay. And today that would be totally different. So there's just an atmosphere now where there's so much that may be possible. And so grateful to be uh, you know, with all of you uh, on this uh, discussion of that. Mm, beautiful. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, Jonathan. One, one person I want to lift up a little bit, and maybe Jonathan, you can speak to this because Clarence Jones is someone whose name was mentioned at the beginning of this. In fact, we had some people showing up thinking that Clarence Jones was going to be here. So maybe we should shine a light a little bit, Jonathan, on the un unknown um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, community of Clarence Jones on the Martin Luther King legacy. Who is Clarence Jones and why should we know about him? Well, uh, well, I want to emphasize the point of community that that Martin Luther King is a cultural icon in the sense that he's symbolic of of a principle. Uh, but there were, you know, but 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 the ideas that he had arose from the spirit, but the words arose in community. C.T. Vivian may he rest in peace, who died last year, is a perfect example of that. Uh, so when, when I helped organize a conference with President Carter uh, with the Middle Powers Initiative on nuclear disarmament, three of them in 2000, 2005, 2010, we had C.T. Vivian give the opening prayer. And you wanted, to, you know, and the point that you were making about feeling the spirit, you know, now, that's what that spirit is that's the luminosity of all of our souls. It's not Martin Luther King or Jesus or Muhammad or Ben or me or you. It is reality. It's what sustains and gives life to the universe. That's why I think more powerful than I have a dream is his insight into the nature of reality. The dream is it's relative to circumstance. The nature of reality is the whole that's why he, he, he said, I've gone to the mountain, I'm not afraid. So um, I met uh, Clarence Jones, uh, one of the hats I wear is, uh, is senior advisor to the summit of the Nobel Peace Laureates. And so I was chairing a press conference in Paris. We had a summit there of Nobel Peace Laureates. And uh, for some reason, I. I was chairing, I quoted Martin Luther King and there was this man sitting next to me and I didn't know who it was. And he tapped me and he said, I'm Clarence Jones. And I didn't realize who he was at the time. And I said, so glad to meet you. Are you with any of the Nobel, you know, any of the Nobel prize groups? And he said, well, I was very close to Martin Luther King. And I said, how's that? And he said, oh, I helped a little bit with his speech writing and lawyering. Well, he's nine, so recent, last year, I was at a conference on King and Gandhi at Stanford, and lo and behold, I was able to have dinner with him. He's 90, and, he's, and he is infused and saturated with that spirit, but he has a lawyer's mind. So it's so interesting, because Martin Luther King had a charismatic leader inspiring preacher's mind, mm. infused with that spirit, and Clarence Jones has a lawyer's mind infused with that spirit. And the two of them were like, you know, you know, re I mean, so, yeah, so he's, he's 90, he lives out in, uh, near in, uh, in the Bay Area, near Stanford. And, uh, and he's still, he's still teaching and preaching and sharing. But it's interesting how our culture is so 
hero oriented and you know it's so oriented toward uh, uh, de- you know somebody else you know like Martin Luther King Martin you know heroes whereas his whole method of politics was empower- empowering everyone of goodwill to participate everyone of goodwill to bring the deepest voice of conscience into action, to inspire everyone to be an agent of God's love, not just black people for black people or Jewish people. And our adversaries at that time, the first thing they did with COINTELPRO, with that horrible man, J. Edgar Hoover, was to push and split and split the Jewish, the Jewish community, which was was so big in it, the, 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 the religious communities to split all these communities and push identity politics. Mm-hmm. And Martin Luther King, you could hear in his message, we are one family. That, and that's the key to reality. And that's the message that, that's the message that will win the day today. That's the message of today. That's that is that we 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 know we no longer we no longer have to go the way of uh, identity politics. We have to go the way of principle. And be you know, at- you know, Jonathan. This is John. That's the perfect transition. Oh my gosh, I just can't believe when you see what's about to unfold here, because where this session is leading is into open space, and we have an open space forum where every voice is invited. We are willfully creating this planetary cosmic reframe. And I'm so grateful for you making that point because it's gonna take all of us. So literally, that's the only reason why I interrupted. Ben knows it because he's been watching. We've done these convergences with sessions that are back to back. And in the global fire ceremony room, I'd be honored if each of us came there you're welcome to come and continue this conversation. And you're gonna be surrounded by people who are just like you, people of principle that are committed to building beloved community at this next level. So I just wanted to make that known, Ben, as you know, unfortunately, we, you guys should be talking for hours. We'd love to hear you. And I know everyone would love to, but there's also open space happening in the yeah, so uh, beloved John, put the put well, the link in the room here, and we can. Yeah, yeah. We, Becky can. Becky's been helping. She's putting the link in. We well, thank you thank to you, Marty. A couple and, more minutes. And to you, Jonathan and Kurt, and you know, if we have a couple more minutes, I, the 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 enthusiasm and the excitement and the inspiration that's been shared here today is, uh, you know, you can feel it vibrating, and um, you know, certainly the work. I want to thank John and uh, Becky and Summer and everyone who's worked hard to create this container of the beloved. Uh, community convergence and for everyone who has joined uh, here in the zoom room and through the the live stream on social media thank you for being with us we are we have our marching orders uh we we don't need to be the wind or create uh to create those winds we, we have our instructions uh, we have our we have our directions we have those principles that jonathan has laid out and you know i feel a great excitement as we come towards the end of january looking towards february and the months ahead towards June and what this global community of goodwill, that big tent that Jonathan has uh, you know, laid out and envisioned and Kurt's been working his whole life for and Marty uh, and so many thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of others for us to really come together and show up uh, and take this initiative in World Unity Week in June. So this has been a great visit together, honoring the legacy of Martin Luther King as an icon for world unity as an icon for brotherhood and sisterhood, as a, as, a, as a way shower for love, as a doorway into the ultimate reality. Uh, we have our instructions and we have our marching orders. So on we go, sh- side by side, shoulder to shoulder uh, to bring this planet into a good way and our, and our global community into a good way. I'm very grateful. Thank you everyone for being with us and we'll see you at the open space and we'll see you on the march, the march together to World Unity Week in June. Thank you, everyone.